So again, welcome everybody to the uh, second night of this nine-day retreat and hopefully you're settling in. Uh, if the weather's very cold, cold is a wonderful way of overcoming sloth and torpor. <laughs> when you're warm, you're very sleepy. So if you are very sleepy and you can't overcome the sloth and torpor, go outside and sit on the... <laughs> out on the veranda somewhere and you'll soon <laughs> start waking up. But look after your bodies. Again, uh, as far as I've heard of the weather, it's going to, the rain is stopping tomorrow and it's uh, especially because the nuns are having their katina tomorrow and uh, warming up. So next week will be getting better and better and better. This is just a test to sort out you know, the the Nambi Pambi cream puffs from the real meditators. But of course, this room is nice and warm for you. They turned up the, the uh, reverse cycle air conditioning. It's the most environmental way of keeping warm. And we've also got in your rooms. They should be nice and warm now. You've got your heaters. So you can always find one place to be, be nice and cozy. And if any of you really feel cold and are suffering, please remember what I was once told from the Tibetan tradition. Every time I feel cold, I remember this, and I don't feel cold anymore. Because apparently, uh, if you wanted to be a meditator in Tibet, the only place to meditate is in the caves up in the mountains. And that was so high up, and there was so much ice and snow, and there was no electricity or gas heaters. The only way you could survive if you wanted to be a hermit, living by yourself outside the monasteries, is by <laughs> developing a type of meditation which actually starts in a heat from inside your body. You now we do have lots of carbohydrates in there, it's learning how to turn them on and create enormous amount of heat by an act of will. And so they would have a special type of meditation and training for monks who aspire to be hermits to learn how to create your own heat inside. And if you pass the test, then of course you could go and stay by yourself in these caves which had no heating whatsoever. You just had your robes, that's all you had. And apparently the final test which you had to pass before you were allowed to go and live by yourself was to take you out in the middle of the winter on the Tibetan plateau at night time when it was so cold, when the wind was blowing and there was snow everywhere, and to sit by the side of a lake. And you had to take all your robes off, but you were allowed one blanket. And the blanket would be dipped in the waters of the lake, <laughs> and then wrapped around you. And to pass the test, uh, from the, well, the time it got dark till dawn, you had to dry, completely dry, three blankets before you could pass the test. Now that, <coughs> that would kill most of you. Uh, me too. <laughs> and imagine that, sitting out there in the middle of winter, in Tibet, in the snow fields, with no clothes except a wet blanket which was just been dipped in freezing water. So that was what you had to do. So whenever I feel cold as a monk, I think, thank goodness I was not born or ordained in the Tibetan tradition. <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness I'm Theravada and I can have heaters. And when I feel what they had to go through, I don't feel cold at all. So <laughs> when you think about that, it's nice and warm. So anyway, let's have some questions for this evening. I'm sure there'll be more questions. It's only half a basket full. That means that you are probably suffering from sloth and torpor. <laughs> you can't think straight. Ah, THJ, the room gets hot and stuffy with the heater on, leading to sleepiness. Could the heater be turned off once the room is warmed up? Thank you. Do I have a vote? Who thinks we should turn the heater off? and just get the blankets dipped in ice water. <laughs> so put your hand up if you think the heater should be turned off. Put your hand up if you think it should be kept on. 
the odds win. <coughs> so if it's too stuffy in here, go into one of the, med the walking meditation halls or go outside. So the thing is you can't please everybody. So this would be the warm room, there'd be a cooler room and the cold room. We do actually have a big freezer in the kitchen, so those of you <laughs> who feel this is too hot, go in the freezer. You can get Daniel, she can knock you in there and take you out later on. <laughs> Very good. First and foremost, thank you Sher and all the others who made the heartwarming, you need heartwarming on these cold warmings, yummy conge and chai po heng ak radish omelette during your retreat time for us. Thank you Ajahn for your compassion, allowing Shirley and others to do that for you. You know, sometimes when we have our retreats we just have some toast and cereals and milk. But the last BF retreat, <coughs> you know, you started complaining, that's not the food we eat. And so I remember last year, a few people volunteered to make conge. And I remember when I came walking here early in the morning, I saw these really happy people cooking conjure because they know they're going to have something nice to eat today. So that's fine, as long as you don't mind cooking it, because you can't get a Westerner to cook your conjure. You have to have someone who was born in Singapore who knows how to cook it. So who was doing it this morning, Shirley? Who was doing it? Okay, where is she? Oh, there she is. Are you okay doing that? Very good, so please thank her. She's, she's giving up her enlightenment, her morning meditation. So you can all have a happy tummy, so please thank her for her great sacrifice. It's usually because she likes it too. <laughs> Dearest Ajahn, the Buddha was right. One gets happier and happier by keeping the five precepts. But I'm not able to convince my family on the Buddha's teachings. Although they are my family, parents and sisters, just this lifetime, it's heartbreaking to see them unhappy. Is there any, <coughs> anything I can do? I've been dedicating wholesome actions, merits to them. Yes, you hypnotize them. <laughs> you brainwash them, you condition them. So, remember they're your family and they always think they know best. So please don't force these teachings on them. The more you push, the more they resist. So use psychology. You just come over here, and when you go back, say, oh, you, what did you do over there? So no, no, it's secret teachings. <laughs> I jump up and I'm not allowed to tell you. Straight away, that makes them interested. Anything secret, anything R-rated in the movies, people get interested in. <laughs> so tell them, no, I'm not telling you. Get any books or, or CDs or whatever, the talks, say, these are mine, keep your hands off, because you know, these are holy books and you know, you're not holy enough to touch these, if these are mine. And that makes them really interesting. <laughs> so little by little, get their interest up until it's so big. So what are you doing over there? No, I can't tell you, it's secret. But what's happening in these books? I can't tell you. And when they do things like that, it gets so interesting that when their minds are open, then you can start teaching them. And they're interested. So use, <laughs> use psychology, don't <coughs> keep on pushing on them. Because when you keep pushing on it, it's just got no value, but when it's secret and rare, and say only very few people can listen to these teachings, when it's very rare and valuable, that's when people get interested. And especially in Singapore, you know, sometimes we think we should charge people $10,000 to come to one of my talks each. You know, in Singapore, you get hundreds of people coming. $10,000 to listen to this Ang Mo monk. He must be good. <laughs> That's what Anthony Robbins does. How much does he charge to go to a talk? I think for a weekend. Somebody said it was about 10,000 bucks or something to go for a weekend or you know, just one day seminar with Anthony Robbins. And who's better, Anthony Robbins or Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> But of course, you don't have much of a reputation because it's all for free. You know, what people think, if it's for free, it can't be any good. Anyway, so that's one way of convincing your, your friends. But in the end, 
they will be convinced because of you, how you change and how kind you are. If you are kind and peaceful, especially when other people get a bit disturbed, that really convinces them. One of our monks, you know, the Norwegian monk, Venerable Nito, on the other side of the road in Bodhinyana Monastery, <coughs> his family hated him being a monk. They were really upset at him being a monk. So much so that when he went to visit them, he showed me their letter. They said, yes, you can come to Norway, but wear a suit. We're not going to pick you up from Oslo Airport if you're in a robe. And he showed me this. He said, what should I do? Should I get a suit? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. You know, you tell your, your parents it's either these robes or naked. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so they picked him up in his robes and they were very upset, but I think what happened was his, his father died. And uh, he arranged all the funeral stuff and did all the, the work for them and, and in the end his brother, his elder brother, sent this letter back to me and said, look, we were really against our brother becoming a Buddhist monk, but now we've seen what he's done. We're incredibly impressed. Whatever you've been teaching him, carry on. Please know he has our full support now. Because when they saw how he behaved during a family crisis and how much he changed, they were really impressed. And I think next month or the month after, two of his brothers are coming to stay at Bodhinyana Monastery. So they're really into it now. And this is just because they saw how he changed and especially how he could behave in a crisis. <coughs> and that's usually what happens. Your family might not be that impressed because they don't know what's going on. But when everybody else starts to break down in a family crisis and you have your wisdom and compassion and strength, it really impresses them. And then they realize the importance of what you've been doing. How to let go of all the senses except noting the breath? I told you this morning, weren't you listening? Oh, it's easy. You just shut your eyes, put your fingers in your ears so you can't hear anything. And stuff your nose, keep your mouth empty and make your body nice and comfortable. Will that work? You know we used to have these sensory deprivation chambers, you know these flotation tanks? Do they have any of those in Singapore? You can actually float them, it's a salt water, the same density as your body, so you actually float in them. And it's nice and body temperature, so it doesn't feel hot, doesn't feel cold. And you're floating in there, so you've got no bodily sensations at all. And they close the lid, so it's totally dark, so you can't see. And it's soundproof, so there's no hearing at all. And it's just it's total sensory deprivation. So all your senses can vanish and disappear. Wouldn't that be wonderful to meditate in? <coughs> we had one of those come to Australia when I first became a monk. And the person who, who brought one in to Australia, the first one in Australia, he invited the monks to try it. And I was really keen to try meditating in a flotation tank and just see how deep you can go. Unfortunately, I was number two monk at that time, and it was a monk senior, Ajahn Jakaro. So he got the first uh, try at the flotation tank. And before I had a go, because the day after he had been in there, our disciples, our followers, brought the newspaper to us, and they saw this big advert Flotation monk, flotation chamber, as used by Buddhist monks. They'd invited us to try it out so they could advertise as used by Buddhist monks. We were exploited. <coughs> and the result of that, I never got my turn. <laughs> I was really fed up. <laughs> but when I asked the other monk, what was it like being in there? He said, look, it's perfectly dark. You now you're floating, you can't feel anything in the body. But he said, the two things which disturb you is your thinking, because that's more disturbing than any other sound, 
And number two, your breath is so loud inside that tank. And what's one of the reasons why? That doesn't matter if you're in a sensory deprivation tank, you've got to deal with your thoughts first of all. Otherwise your senses will never disappear and to calm your breath down. <coughs> Otherwise your senses won't disappear. So that's the first thing we do. Just learn how to be without thinking. Apparently these days somebody told me that the only way they can relax in these sensory deprivation chambers is play music in there to try and stop your thinking. Or if you want to play golf, they put a golf video in there to try and relax you or something. Because <coughs> people will, um, if they're sensory deprived, will go into thoughts and fantasies. And that's just what will fill their mind. Not with the five senses, but with the thoughts of the five senses. All these fantasies and memories and plans, writing your biography, whatever it is you do, you're in there just thinking all the time. So that's why always the first thing we have to do before we let go of the five senses is to be calm and don't go thinking so much. So how can you stop the thinking? Sometimes, you know, I was, instead of just using force, this is a general teaching in meditation or in life, don't <coughs> use willpower, use wisdom power. Wisdom power is always far stronger than any willpower. So what do I mean by using wisdom power? You think, why am I thinking? Where does it come from? And when I started investigating you know, the source of thinking, where it comes from, why I think, instead of trying to stop it, find, find out why first of all. And then you can actually stop the source instead of stop the result, the thinking. Find out the source of thinking. And after a while you find out that you think because of discontent. You're not happy. That's why we think. Whenever you're a little bit depressed or upset, you go fantasizing, you're dreaming, you've got all this, this <coughs> filing cabinet of happy thoughts or happy memories or your favorite fantasy whatever you want to do in life. And that you bring them out when you're upset. <coughs> and this is just the way the human being reacts to suffering. We think, because we, then we can get in our own world. And it's not just always happy thoughts. Sometimes we can think of negative thoughts because sometimes even that gives us pleasure. Because it takes us away from the humdrum suffering of life. It's a reason why we watch movies, or we read books, or watch stupid things on TV. It's just the way we try and escape and deal with the suffering of life. Or why it is when you're in hospitals, you have a TV in front of your bed. What do they have that there for? To take your mind off the suffering in your body. So this is just the way we react to suffering. And so it's just because we're unhappy. So go to the core of it. And when you make happiness an important part of the meditation, so that's why I tell jokes, that's, <coughs> that's why I make people laugh and do silly and funny things, you know, trying to do sadhu, 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 mess around with a teddy bear, whatever it is. You can see when you're happy and laughing, you don't think so much, if you think at all. So we try to create a lot of happiness. When you're happy, joyful, you are content. When you're content, you don't need to think. You don't need to go off into the past looking for something to distract you, or looking for something in the future to plan and change. When you're happy and content, there's no need to think. So this is where we're coming from. So little by little we're trying to create this sense of happiness in meditation, just gratitude for being here, the joy of being on holiday, the <coughs> beauty of you know, Jhana Grove Retreat Centre, you're totally free. You haven't got boss to tell you what to do. You don't have to worry about anything here. You haven't got kids to worry about. You haven't got a husband to feed. You haven't got a wife to listen to, nag, nag, nag. You're totally free. 
please remember that. Think, wow, isn't this great? And when you appreciate, you don't take the peace and the freedom for granted, you really appreciate this. Then you feel so content, you'll find you won't have many thoughts. You get upset or angry, you'll find the thoughts will start coming into your head. <coughs> so see if you can get a foundation of happiness, not grumpiness, and you'll find the thoughts get less and less and less. And that's why we try and have happy meditations. So one <coughs> way of doing that. Now I've mentioned the first night of posture. Uh, people keep on saying, oh it's much better meditation when you cross your legs this way, when you put your arms that way, when you keep your back straight or lean this way or that way. He said, no, the only important part of your posture which I ask you to develop it's not how you have your legs crossed. It's not how you have your arms put. You know the Tibetans do it like this. Theravada's doing like this. Sometimes I do it like this. <laughs> I don't care where you put your hands, that's not important. The only important part of your body which is necessary for deep meditation is your mouth. <laughs> Smile. Now you may think that that's just new age rubbish, but it actually works. When I was a student at Cambridge, you know, I was, you're supposed to be smart, but you know, the other people are sometimes smarter than you. We had our college boat club, and they were looking for new victims to join and train to row these stupid boats up and down the river. And <coughs> What they used to do, they offer free sherry, good sherry. And those were the days, I wasn't keeping five precepts there, oh free sherry, I'm, a, I'm going to that. And before I know it, I signed up for the boat club. You know, I must have given drunken too much sherry for that, because I'm not a sportsman. You know the only, this is true, if you don't know this already, you haven't heard the talk, there was only one sport which I represented Cambridge for, against Oxford. Only one sport, and now if you know me, I haven't got a competitive bone inside of me. You know, and the only sport I represented Cambridge at, this is absolutely true, was tiddlywinks. <laughs> you know tiddlywinks? The kids game, you have these little um, count, coloured counters and you, you try and get them into the pot. <laughs> it was a joke sport! You know, no one could take tiddlywinks seriously. And that's why, you know, I, I, I was a tiddlywink player. And we'd always have a competition once a year with Oxford, the Cambridge-Oxford tiddlywink match. And I, that's, that's the sort of sport I was into. Anything serious, no way. <laughs> so, I was at rowing. And I remember once we were in some sort of silly race. I don't know why, it doesn't matter who wins. You know, especially if you lose, it's much better because you don't get so tired afterwards. <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, but the, the coach was shouting at me because you're know, pulling the oar and it's, if you really have you know, sport, you get so tired it actually hurts, you have to go through pain. And the coach you know, was on his bicycle on the towpath, shouted at me, he said, you're making an ugly face, smile. And so there I was, pulling this oar, trying to go as fast as you possibly can, and I smiled instead of frowning. And this is one of the first times I realised it was much easier to pull the oar, you had more energy when you were smiling. <coughs> and it's so common to know this in psychology, whatever you do, if you smile it's always much easier to do. So if you're washing the dishes and grimacing, what a I, I paid good money to come here, I didn't come to wash the dishes. In Singapore I got a maid to do dishes. <laughs> if they found out when I was washing dishes here in Jhana Grove, oh, I'd never live it down. <laughs> Whatever it is, look, if you grimace and make a bad face, it really is painful. But if you smile while you're washing dishes, I'm washing the dishes, look at me, isn't this wonderful? It's much easier to do. So, meditation. Why not smile when you're meditating? It's 
surprise, surprise, it's much easier to do. It's much easier to watch the breath when you've got a smile on your face. And when you give I've got to watch the breath. I'm going to watch the breath. Come <laughs> That does not work. And you get all these thoughts coming up in your head when you do things like that. So, smile when you're meditating. Because when the face smiles, straight away you get like a happy mind. The two are connected, it's just like the brain thinks smiling, something must be happy, and so it actually looks at happiness. It's a very easy way to get joy. And because you're smiling when you're meditating, you do not think so much. Try it. Simple, but it works. So this is the way you can actually stop a lot of the thinking. Now, of course, after a while, when you settle in, you know, the first few days here, it's a bit cold here, a bit cold there, you've got to learn just to, you know, adjust and find your way around and how things work and the right time to have a cup of tea, where to get the tea and stuff from. But after a while, you get really relaxed in this place. It's like it becomes your second home. And when you get relaxed in this place, you actually do get a lot of joy and happiness. And you find quite naturally all your thinking will get less and less and less and less and less. Please notice why, it's because you're happy. And there were times in the meditation where you get so peaceful, so nice, that this delightful breath or happy breath which I keep talking about in my books, you're so happy you just, you can't think. A thought comes in, no, I'm not interested. Have you noticed how much you think when you're watching the movie? Do you really think when you're watching the movie? Of course not, because you're enjoying yourself. The mind is satisfied. It's being entertained by whatever's happening on the movie. It's just like when you're listening to me, you're being entertained, so you're not thinking. <laughs> But if I gave a boring lecture, have you ever been to these boring lectures and then you're just thinking about you know, what you have to do when you go to work afterwards or thinking about fantasies? Apparently, I read this in Time magazine, someone did a survey in the United States, said <coughs> in most lectures, 95% of the people, girls and boys, instead of listening to the lecture, are thinking sexual fantasies. That's what they found out in the United States. Why do they do that? Because they're not being engaged, they're not getting any happiness out of the talk. If the talk is entertaining and meaningful, you don't think. So you're getting the message now. Once happiness comes, you don't need to think so much. And one of the reasons people think a lot in our modern world is a sign of how unhappy they are. Da, da, da. Let go, live for the moment. In the long run, is it sustainable? If you're thinking of the long run, you're not living in the moment, for goodness <laughs> sake. <laughs> is, it good for this? is it a good philosophy, especially in downtime? Why do you call it downtime? As if it's really negative and you're really down and in the dumps, in the lower realms. No, whenever you've got nothing to do, it's not downtime, it's uptime. When you're working and busy, that's downtime. <laughs> so straight away we give it the wrong name and that adds a negativity to rest. You're down time. No, call it up time. It's the same with Australia. It's really offensive to call this place down under. <laughs> this is not down under. From where I'm sitting now, it's up and above. <laughs> that's why when I first came here, I was amazed to see this new map of the world. And it was made in Australia, not made in United States or not made in England. And the corrective map of Australia had Australia right in the top, in the middle. And I think, you know, Europe was in the corner somewhere, United States was in the other corner, it wasn't important. And it was, England was down under and United States was in the corner somewhere where it belonged. <laughs> Why not? You can do that. It's just perception, that's all. And so, don't call it down, call it uptime. For yourself, for peace, for Nibbana, that's hard, that's uptime. So when you have some free time, 
is uptime, not downtime, okay? And so, <coughs> when you let go and live for the moment, it's much more sustainable because if you live in the future, and you live in the past and you think and worry, is that sustainable? No, you die young. So this is much more sustainable. You'll have a longer life. You know the secret of a long life? To drink lots of long life milk. <laughs> That's what it says on the packet, long life milk. They should know. <laughs> as, as, and as I think Dania pointed out, the way to lose weight and just you know, get thinner and thinner and thinner is to condense yourself by l drinking lots of condensed milk. <laughs> Condensing is just get thinner and thinner. <laughs> Hasn't worked yet for one day. Anyway. Sometimes images or pictures come up in my meditation spontaneously. Emotions also come up. Why does this happen? Because you've got a mind, you've got a brain. That's what a brain does. It sees things and emotions come up. So it's par for the course. It depends what images come up. If you've got images of monsters or images of chainsaws where you're going to cut everybody's heads off. <laughs> or if you've got images of someone calling you to kill everybody in Jhana Grove. <laughs> then that's a problem. <laughs> but if it's like beautiful images come up, images of the Buddha, or images of monks, or images of nuns, that's good images, let it come up, enjoy it. It's not the image, but your reaction to it, that's important. And, and same with emotions. Somebody asked this earlier, and it's, I told this, I talked a long time ago, it's not that all emotions are bad and you're supposed to get rid of all emotions. I think they said this morning, becoming an arahat is not like being Dr. Spock in um, Star Trek. Remember Dr. Spock? I used to watch Star Trek as a kid, it's still going on. You remember Dr. Spock? No emotions? You know, with the pointy ears? Now that's not an arahat, okay. <laughs> has got no <laughs> An enlightened being has the emotions of loving kindness, metta, karuna, compassion, mudita, upeka, they've got piti sukha, the joy and inspiration which comes up. You know that sometimes when you look at the pictures of the old monks, the real monks, the tough, you know the toughest monk in our tradition was Ajahn Mahabua. Uh, really tough. Say it. Sit up straight. Don't talk. Don't move your hand. Don't put your hands in. Don't push your feet out like that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Ajahn Mahabua. And in public, people were terrified of him. But when I went to stay with him for, for a week, you know, just to check out this, you know, how they really are, because I was a monk, you know, when all the lay people left, you know, you would hang out with the other monks and we're having tea in the afternoon. He'd come out to my boy, he just sits down, oh, I sit down on a low seat and what are you chatting about? And he started telling stories and telling jokes and it was really funny. And some of the people, if the lay people at that time saw this monk laughing and carrying on, they would get a totally different understanding of these forest monks. They weren't just tough, that was just their, <coughs> their persona in public. But you know, when you're all gone around the scenes, they were just a... a bu Actually, the, I came to the conclusion they were just a bunch of kids playing around. That's actually... The, that's very beautiful, just they were so unaffected. And so sort of good fun to be with, and they would laugh. So that was holy monks. So they had emotions, they had a lot of happiness and a lot of joy. So <coughs> don't ever think that you have to be emotionless, like some cyborg. Today I am not happy, but I am not sad. <laughs> I have let go of everything. Oh my goodness, I'm about to die. This is okay. Ajahn Brahm, that was a very funny joke but you never laugh. 
That's crazy. People aren't like that. So you're allowed to have the positive emotions. Be inspired. If inspiration comes, let it come and use it. If happiness in meditation comes, bring it on. The Buddha said this is important, this should be developed. It leads to all the deep states of meditation. So the bad emotions, jealousy, fear, anger, guilt, those things, yes, they're to be let go of. And the positive ones are to replace them. Other emotions as a result of my thoughts, if it is negative, doesn't mean I don't have a right view, or are some emotions useful? I think I've answered that one. How to sustain the mind in the present moment long enough, as your advice has to do, before it starts watching the breath. My mind's tendency is to watch the breath as soon as I sit and calm my mind. That's okay. As long as it's the breath happening in the present moment. Because when you look at, say, me, there's many aspects you can see. You can be listening to my voice, seeing how my robe's falling off, seeing just, you know, if I've got any nose hair or whatever it is. You can watch all sorts of different aspects of whatever you're observing. So you're observing the breath, but the aspect that you pay attention to, first of all, is that it's in the present moment. The present moment breath. That's what you're watching. <coughs> so you can be aware of the breath, but as long as I'm watching the breath happening now, the present moment is the most important thing. And it doesn't matter what you're watching. Watching the breath, you can listen to the sound of the air con rumbling in the background. You can be feeling the pressure in your bottom against the cushion. As long as it's happening in the present moment, fine. And its presence is the main object you're watching. That particular aspect of whatever you're observing, it is happening now. And then it doesn't matter. So you can watch the breath and you're still doing present moment awareness because that's the most important thing you're watching, its presence. Dear Ajahn, what's the best way to give loving kindness and compassion to oneself? Easy. Hands out. Hands out, everyone. Bring them in. <laughs> Go over the top. That's a great way to give loving kindness to oneself. See, it worked. Just, if no one else will give you a hug, because you've got some disease or whatever. <laughs> You can give yourself a hug, and it's nice. Or, Teddy. <laughs> oh. So give Teddy a hug, and you get loving kindness back. So that's the best way. That's what we've got. How many, has Teddy Bear been used today, or has it sat there all day by itself? <laughs> oh, poor Teddy Bear, it's lonely. Give it a cuddle. You know, <laughs> when I did teddy bear meditation in Hong Kong, there was a list, a roster, of people to take it back to bed <laughs> every night. <laughs> and I, did, I bagged the teddy bear for Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, so you could take the teddy bear back into your room with you and cuddle it when you go to sleep. What's the best way to give love and counsel and compassion to oneself? Those are the two ways. What's the best antidote for procrastination? Put off procrastination to another day. <laughs> How should one stop having ill will for others and being judgmental so often? Gee, I mean, you don't know what others are up to. So how can you have ill will towards them? You know, you haven't got a clue what they're here for. So. Don't worry about what other people do and say. They're all crazy anyway. You're the only smart person in here. So just other people do what they need to do. Does that teddy bear have any ill will towards anybody? Anyone can pick it up and you get beautiful loving kindness back. So be like a teddy bear. Always. <laughs> able to give happiness to everybody and never having a moment ill will towards anything in the world. I, pre I prefer to sit on the ground and not a chair to meditate as I feel more grounded. However, after about 20 minutes my cross legs get numb or is this 
Or is it, oh, as my legs, my ankles hurt, so I have to interrupt my meditation for a few minutes to resolve the issue. What can I do? Look, the chair is grounded. You see those four legs? <laughs> it connects you to the ground. So it is grounded, okay? So sit on the chair and you don't have sore legs, for goodness sake. Or if you really prefer, you don't like the chair, see how many cushions you can actually collect until one on top there, exactly the height of the chair, and then you think, well, you know, they're all connected, so I am grounded now. Even a cushion you're not grounded, because there's a cushion there between you and the ground. Even if you throw away the cushion, you've got the bamboo floor between you and the ground. If you take away the bamboo floor, you've got the concrete between you and the ground. You're not grounded. You're cushioned. <laughs> you're bamboo floored. Whatever it is, so it doesn't really matter. So actually, to sit on a chair, and just that perception of having to sit on the floor can be taken away. Look at all the wise people in the back. So please join the wise ones who use a chair. <coughs> That's why I got these chairs here. This meditation center, I designed most of it. You make sure that you know you have these the, <coughs> the floor, so you sit on the brown part, so you've got places you can walk up and instead of in some meditation rooms, to get in and out you have to climb over each other. <laughs> this has been all well thought out. That's why I went to a lot of trouble getting those chairs. Sit on them, please. <laughs> please explain how to do walking meditation. Thank you. Yes, start at one end, walk to the other end, turn around and walk back again. Did anyone ever teach you how to walk? Not, well, maybe your mum and dad did, so you know how to walk, so walk. Easy. Okay, <coughs> so you've got the paths over there, about the right leg. So when you're on the red carpet there, it means you can't go left, you can't go right. If you start to stray off the path, you know, you soon feel it. It's just, it changes, it's cold. So, you start at one end. Uh, I should say, put your attention, uh, your focus two meters in front. Do not need to get the tape measure out and say, oh, it's only 199, I better sort of lengthen it a bit. Roughly, it's good enough, two meters, okay? And because you're focusing on the ground two meters in front, it means you're not looking left, you're not looking right, you're not looking too far ahead or too far behind. And if there's any obstacle there, you can see it. Some people say, can't we meditate with our eyes closed when we're doing walking meditation? If you try that, you're going to bang into the wall. <laughs> and I don't mind you what you do to your head, but you get blood and stuff on the wall and it's just so hard to clean off. <laughs> So out of compassion for me and Daniel, who will probably have to do the cleaning, please keep your eyes open. But if you insist on doing that, please go and bring a crash helmet next time. <laughs> and you can close your eyes and do whatever you want. But in the meantime, you look two meters in front, which means you, you know, you feel safe. You're not going to trip over anything. You just see the wall coming before you hit it. And as I mentioned, first thing, present moment awareness, just be here. Second, silence. Third, feeling in the breath, feel, so feeling in the feet. You can know which foot is moving, you can feel all these sensations as you move forward. Until you have such a full awareness of what you're, uh, how you're walking, so you know the first part of your foot which leaves the floor. Is it your big toe, or your heel, or the ball of the foot? What leaves the floor first? And what touches the ground first after you've stepped? And what meets the floor last of all? What does it feel like to walk? <coughs> and if you really get into it, you get so aware, there's amazing thousands of feelings in your feet and lower legs as you walk. And it gets absolutely fascinating. And you don't worry about trying to be the slowest on the walking meditation path because it happens in some retreats when you have eight or nine walking meditation paths parallel to each other, there is a reverse race to see who can walk the slowest. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes people do that, they see someone else walking really slow, damn them, and you try and walk even slower, and then they see you and say, I'm going to beat this guy and be even slower. And it becomes this stupid slow race. <coughs> Don't worry about what other people are doing, you just walk naturally. 
and just uh, do whatever you need to do to calm down, relax. So that means you're not thinking all over the place, you're in the present moment, focusing on a small area of reality, you get very peaceful very quickly. If that doesn't work, if you're really restless when you're doing walking meditation, you can do a mantra. My favorite mantra for doing walking meditation, which those who have been here before know, as the left foot moves forward, you recite to yourself, I will die. As the right foot moves, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. It focuses your attention because you know, even if everything else I said you don't believe in and trust, you know that's an absolute truth. I will die, that's for sure. And sometimes people think it's a joke. But it's not a joke because it's real. Each one of you is going to die. And you don't know when. It may be before this retreat <laughs> is over. It does happen, you know. And when you think of that, it's wonderful because you've got nothing to worry about. All your worries about your business. You're going to die, baby. Wow, I'd have nothing to worry about. Your kid's education, your dogs, your husband, what, is he, what he's up to when he knows you're nine days away somewhere. You don't have to worry about anything because when you die, everything is let go of. It just teaches you how to detach. And <coughs> no joke, if you do this meditation, first of all you think it's a joke, then you realize how true it is, you face fear. And if you keep on walking, I will die, that's for sure, I will die, that's for sure. After fear comes incredible peace because you're going to let go. So you let go now and all the attachments, all the things you worry about, all the stuff which you fill your head with, it's just in the right perspective, it's totally meaningless. So you don't worry about a thing, you just let go of everything. And you're walking so peacefully. I would die, that's for sure, what a relief. There's another way of doing walking meditation, it's great fun. What is the aim of walking meditation? Is it focus or mindfulness? How is it, cons how is it consistent with stillness? Because the mind becomes still, it doesn't go wandering into the past or the future or thinking about too much. So <coughs> it doesn't get as still as the mind in sitting meditation, but it's a great support. Venerable Sir, the Buddha taught the Eightfold Path to avoid suffering. Why virtue? Why stillness? In other words, what has meditation has to do with suffering? Everything. That's why I should have said this first of all, but now is a good time. There are two types of meditation. And don't think that means we pasana and samatha, that's not what I mean. The two types of meditation which people practice today are called second noble truth meditation and third noble truth meditation. What is the second noble truth? Craving leads to suffering. So that's called second noble truth meditation. I want, I want, I want. And what does that lead to? Suffering. <coughs> so if you are suffering in the meditation, if you're fed up, if you're frustrated, if nothing is happening, and if you want to sort of uh, go and talk to the organizers and get the next plane back to Singapore, you've had enough already. Oh, what am I going to do another seven days of this? Seven days or six days? What day is it? I don't know. Oh, another seven days of this. I can't take this any longer. I'm suffering. If that's you, it's because you've been doing Second Noble Truth Meditation. If you're suffering, it means you're wanting something. So that's not the right type of meditation. Do Third Noble Truth Meditation, which is letting go of wanting leads to Nibbana, happiness. If you're having a good meditation, it's because you've let go of wanting. That's called Third Noble Truth Meditation. 
straight down the line, fundamental, basic Buddhism. If you want something, you suffer. Second noble truth. You let go, happy. Third noble truth. So, look at your meditation. Are you happy or are you suffering? And if you're suffering, don't be because I, I, I'm not trying hard enough, I put more effort in. No, that's not the cause. The cause is you're wanting something. That's why you're suffering. Second noble truth. <coughs> and if you're happy and peaceful, having a wonderful meditation, why? It's because you'll find you've let go of wanting. You're just happy to be here, so content. This is good enough for me. I don't want anything, I'm just happy to be here. Then you get so peaceful, that's called third noble truth, meditation. So that's why suffering is just fundamental to meditation. This is not suffering meditation. You realize that's wanting. When you let go of all wanting, that means you're still. When you're still, you're so happy. That's why I'm a monk. People ask you, what do you want? Nothing. Well, please, we get you something. What? You know I'm not allowed to, to receive money. You know, you know, because you've seen me such a long time. But there is a loophole. There's always a loophole in everything. And the, <laughs> and the loophole is, you're not allowed to give me money, but you can say, Ajahn Brahm, you've helped me so much. Can I get something for you? Something, not a donation for the nuns monastery, not a donation for Jhana Grove or Bodhinyana monastery, it's something for you. I've already given enough to these monasteries and other projects, something for you. I said, but what do you need? Something I can get, get for you. And usually what you say is the amount of money. Say, $100 or $500, what can I get for you? I've got $500, put it aside, whatever you want. That is actually allowable. Then I can think, what do I need for $500? And I can tell you. But don't you ever do that to me. <laughs> because many years ago someone did that. I'd helped them in Thailand, and they came to me and said, you know, it's called actually the Mendica Allowance in Pali. They said, I really want to give you something personal, up for a hundred baht. And that was, you know, when I was a young monk, almost 40 years ago. And my mind went totally blank. What, you know, what do I want for a hundred baht? I couldn't think of anything. And this was a lay person, just like you, got a job and a family, and I was standing there trying to think, come on, I've got to go back to work. And I realized they were getting very impatient. I, you know, I was a smart monk, I said, look, I'll think about this tonight, why don't you come back tomorrow and I'll give you the list. He said, oh, good idea, I'll come back tomorrow. So that night, I got out a piece of paper which was literally, we didn't have any paper, it was the back of a mosquito coal packet. You know, so there's no place I could write on. So I said, what do I need? So obviously straight away I need a notebook. Nothing much, it's not an expensive item, just a notebook. And I was writing in a pencil, and the pencil was just you know, almost finished. So nothing, just like one of those big bio, you know, ballpoint pens. You know, not a Mont Blanc or a Park or anything like that, just something I could write with, you know, something reasonable for a monk. And I was writing just by a candlelight, and that's supposed to be bad for your eyes. So, you know, some of the monks in the forest had these you know, oil lamps. So, you know, a kerosene lamp, can I have one of those as well? And talking about lights, my flashlight was just almost dead. And, you know, you need that because there were snakes and all sorts of other creepy crawlies in the forest and sometimes you don't have any shoes. And actually, I need to need another pair of shoes as well. And you know when you want something, you think of another thing you need, which is associated with it? And that's what happened. I, I wrote this whole list down and I soon realized 100 baht was not enough. <laughs> and that was so much suffering. Because now I, 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 I was thinking about it, now I wondered how I survived without it. It was no longer sort of you know, a want, it was actually a necessary, an absolute desperate necessity to have some shoes to walk on. And when I was trying to think of what I could take off the list, all these other ideas started coming in. And I wrote more things, and that thousand baht was not enough now. <coughs> but fortunately, I had enough wisdom to realize what was going on. And I screwed that piece of paper up, and I threw it away. 
in the spittoon. And when that guy came to the next day, I told him, don't you ever do that to me again. I was such a content and happy monk before, before you gave me 100 baht to spend. <laughs> and I see that's a way of desire and wanting. So, you know, once you start desire, wanting, it has no end. How long do you have to work? Even if you won the lotto and got a thousand, hundred million dollars, would you stop working? Would you be content? Have you ever noticed, this isn't a truth, people who win the lottery always buy another ticket next week. It's just a well-known fact <coughs> throughout the world. What do they do that for? Because, you know, 200 million US is not enough, I want 300. Imagine what I could do with the extra 100. <laughs> you understand what craving is? It knows no end. So you can't find any peace that way. The only way you can find peace is be content with what you have. This is good enough for me. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't jhana growth good enough? It's more than good enough. But you know we can make it better. We could have, instead of um, this air conditioning, because some people say it's too hot. You know, if I can get some more money out of you, we could have personal air conditioning. You can put it down from the <laughs> ceiling. <coughs> so individual air con. And you know what it's like sometimes, having to go to the toilet, you have to walk all the way over there. Just a little hole in the floor there. <laughs> a little curtain comes around, so you don't even have to move. And as for the, <coughs> the cushions, I mentioned this, these are just such, you know, last century, these cushions. Why can't we have high-tech cushions? You know, surely we can do better than these simple stuff. You can press a little button, maybe many buttons, and just, you know, the back can inflate with air <laughs> to lift you up. Or if this leg is a bit sore, you can move this leg up just by the cushion can come up. If you're really cold, you can have, like they have in Japan, underfloor heating, but this is in your cushion, you can warm it up. If you have sloth and torpor, you can cool it down. Or even better with sloth and torpor, another button somewhere in the back which can make you a nice cup of coffee. You have buttons for latte, <laughs> flat white, or whatever, long black, whatever it is. I don't know my coffees. So you can actually make yourself a cup of coffee. So great, you sloth and torpor, you press the button, two minutes later, you can have your cup of coffee without even leaving your seat. Wouldn't that be amazing? You can see that desire has no end to it, which is one of the problems. So this is good enough, for goodness sake, you've got your bottom on there, and actually your bottom has got enough padding on it, you don't really need those <laughs> cushions. <laughs> so this is the problem with craving, so be careful. Some meditation teachers say students not stick to their method and mustn't use other methods of meditation. It is harmful. How? Why is this so? Buddha himself learned from different teachers and he found his own path. Yes, you must only stick to Ajahn Brahm's method of meditation. Ajahn Brahm's is the best. All other meditating teachers suck. They don't know what they're talking about. They're all wrong. I'm the only one who's right. If I said that, what would you think of me? They're so arrogant, so conceited, so bigoted. So I don't know why people actually accept that from their teachers. When you went to university, those who went to university, how many teachers of, say, chemistry did you have? Not one, you had many. Because many teachers, they enhance your understanding and knowledge. They see it from different angles. And our job is to add everything together, like the simile of the seven blind elephants, okay? All coming together and comparing their knowledge adding their experience and understanding. So it doesn't confuse you, it actually usually enhances your understanding of meditation. Just like the Buddha had many disciples and people went to Sariputta, Moggallana, Ananda, they all had their strengths and their weaknesses. So no, go to many meditation teachers. You find some you like the best suit you. But that doesn't mean you go and go to others to get an extra boost of you know, things which I can't do. So any teacher who says you must stick to their method and don't use any others, 
That doesn't make any sense to me. As for me, I would give the advice, don't follow my meditation, go to others. I want to get rid of you. <laughs> I just work too hard, you know, I just do so many talks and I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to get rid of my disciples <laughs> so I can have an easy life. I'm trying to offend you, trying to make you upset. So, oh, I'm never going to go and see the Ajahn Brahm ever again. Yes! <laughs> That's the job of a teacher, I keep on saying. The job of a teacher is to get rid of disciples. So they graduate, so they're wise, they know everything about meditation, they don't need to come on a retreat ever again. And I keep on saying, I must be one of the worst teachers in the world. Because some of you have been coming to my retreats for how many years now? <laughs> God, I must be. If I was at school or university, I'd have the stack by now. <laughs> so no, please. You just, wherever you find wisdom and inspiration, go there. No one teacher just has the, what's it called, not the franchise, has all the goods on all the, all the, um, the types of meditation and Dhamma. Dear Ajahn, is, if, is Samadhi means have attained jhanas stronger, or stang, stanzas? Thank you. Samadhi stillness, so any type of stillness, please do not call it concentration. It does not mean concentration. Samadhi is not concentration, this is not concentration meditation. People think it's insight or concentration. There's no such thing as concentration meditation. There never was, there never will be. It means stillness. It's a totally different concept. And unfortunately, the way that word was translated by the first people who translated the Pali into English, they got it wrong, they stuffed up, they made a mistake. It means stillness. When you call it stillness, it changes the whole idea of meditation. Concentration is what you do. You put effort, you focus, you force, and you get headaches. That's not how to meditate. Stillness. And people should know that because the idea of uh, you know, the monks meditating in the mountains, being so still and peaceful, and when you get into meditation you're so still and peaceful, you know that's meditation, that's what samadhi means. So, <coughs> that's what samadhi means. And when you get really still, super still, those are the jhanas, incredible states of stillness. It's one of the things which you experience in meditation. Sometimes you think you can't be more peaceful than this. And then you suddenly get more peaceful. Wow! You can't comprehend that such deep stages of stillness when nothing moves at all. And it gets even more still than that. So this becomes a great adventure of meditation. And it's fascinating, it blows your mind just how peaceful things can be. All the Buddha, Buddhas we know about were from India. What makes India so conducive to enlightenment? Where you're sitting now, in Western Australia, on the, the scarp, on this band of hills. This is not my invention, this is basic um, geology. The tectonic plates, you know, which formed you know, the crust of the earth, split many centuries ago. And where we're actually sitting now, many thousands of years ago, was actually joined to India. It's not, this is, you, you look in, this is absolutely true, you look in Wikipedia or other, Western Australia was right next to India. Not down below where the Perth city is, that was under the sea, that was the sand. These rocks are exactly the same geological form as the east coast of India. We were once part of that great continent. It was used to be called Godwana land or something. But this, we were connected to India. And we all know that previous in Buddhas were in India. But also, where you're sitting now was connected to India. Many Buddhas would have walked over the land of Jhanagov, Bodhinyana and Dharmasaha. <laughs> now you know why these places are so powerful. Unfortunately, Singapore was nowhere near that. 
That is actually true. It was in the newspaper some time ago, and I know that. Check it on the internet when you go home. Just where we are now was right nestled in. There's a little bit of India, which is a little bit of a um, concave. We were nestled right in there. Perth, this area around here, was right next to India. So isn't it, there must be some reason. Why is it there's a great monasteries here in the West, nothing like this in Melbourne or Sydney or Queensland? Why? Now you know. <laughs> okay, nice one. Oops. I find the feeling of pain due to sickness is so strong. How do you meditate when you had severe fever as a young monk? It's just desperation. It's hard to meditate when you're sick or you're in pain. But you know, sometimes you're sitting there for a few days or a couple of weeks in my case, and you think, just no, just got no other choice. But you have to. It's amazing when you have to, you can. The most wonderful thing about that experience was that you can meditate if you really want to, if you really get your act together. Most people are lazy, but if you really want to, in severe fever or pain, you can just sit there and get into the deepest of meditations. That was so reassuring, simply because you know it's possible. So yeah, it's possible, but it's usually difficult. It's much easier when you have a comfortable body. But at least you know if when you're on your deathbed and everything aches and everything is in pain, you're falling apart, you know it's possible. You just have to do the letting go. Just being in this present moment, not thinking, and just allowing just this moment to be. No fear. Because a lot of time with pain is fear. And the fear thing stops you letting go. And just let it be and soon the whole body vanishes. It's such a relief to be free of pain. It can be done. So there we go, those are the questions for this evening. This evening's entertainment for you. So when you're entertained, hopefully you're not thinking. And when you're not thinking, you're at peace. See, it works. And there's more to come. This is only the first sort of question and answer night. More to come tomorrow and another talk at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning and following 8 o'clock some more interviews but not tomorrow afternoon because unfortunately I have to go to a wedding. I'm not getting married by the way. <laughs> <coughs> but I'm blessing someone else's marriage. I try to avoid it. Try to get out of it. Or even better, trying to get them out of marrying. <laughs> but they won't have a bar of it so I have to go and make the best of it. So I'll be away tomorrow afternoon. So have a nice night, and before we finish off, what do we do? Three sadhus. Let's play ball. Hey? No. Sadhu. 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 <laughs> Very good. So have a nice night. See you in the morning. And keep warm. If you want to have a cup of tea or water, whatever, there's all sorts of stuff over in the kitchen.